So thanks everybody for being here. I'm Michelle Rodriguez, Virginia Sea Grants Professional Development Coordinator. If you have emailed us at VASG at virginiaseagrant.org, uh, you've likely heard from me. And if this is your first time connecting with us, welcome and again, thanks for being here. I'm joined today by my co-host Sam Lake, our Fellowship and Research Coordinator, and Jay Clark, our Communications Manager. Jay is going to be here for tech help and just for general good times. Uh, so I will say I am fairly new in the fellowship realm. I have been with Virginia Sea Grant for a couple of years, but on the sort of post award side, I'm getting more into the, the pre award and working with students earlier. So I appreciate your grace and patience with me as this is my first time doing the information webinar. But again, I have our resident expert, Sam here, who will help as needed. Sam, is there anything you wanted to say? Nope, I think we got a, a wealth of knowledge and hopefully some tips to share with everyone today. And do feel free to use the chat if you have some logistical issues or anything else too. Yep, and I apologize, you'll see my head kind of moving up and down. I've got a couple things open on my screen. Um, but I hope you're paying attention to the PowerPoint and not us floating heads here. So um, again, if you have not popped onto that Jamboard, please do so if you have questions or just want to see what other folks are asking. Maybe it's something that you would also have a question for. And there you have Jay's information, but he's also here. Um, but I'm going to guess if you had tech issues, you might not be here. So please take note of Jay's information here. Okay, so as you can see from our outline here, we're going to talk a bit about Virginia Sea Grant. We're going to talk about the Virginia or graduate research opportunities. We're going to focus mostly on the Virginia Sea Grant Graduate Research Fellowship. We also are going to go through kind of the purpose and goals of the Graduate Research Fellowship, give you a quick overview of the RFP. Hopefully you all have read through that announcement. I know it's a few pages long. We actually managed to shorten it this year. Uh, there's a lot of great information in there and there's no way that we could cover everything in it with any detail and save your uh, sanity. I'm um, gonna go over also what's new. Some of you may have applied for a graduate research fellowship with Virginia Sea Grant before, and we have updated our RFP and we're gonna go through what's new. Also gonna give some tips and recommendations for a successful application. Also, we're gonna to wanna to take your questions. Obviously, we've mentioned the Jamboard before and there's that link again. Um, so without further ado, so what is Virginia Sea Grant? Who are we? So again, some of you are familiar, but for those just getting to know us, we are a federal state partnership funded by NOAA with matching support from our six university partners. As you can see from your screen, those partners are George Mason University, Old Dominion University, University of Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University, Virginia Tech, and William and & Mary in VIMS, and Virginia Institute of Marine Science, better known as VIMS. And if you don't know, VIMS is the Marine Science Graduate School for William and & Mary, and that is why you see them together. And our offices are physically located on the VIMS campus in Gloucester Point, Virginia. We work in four functional areas, research, extension, education, and communication. And I like to say the Graduate Research Fellowship falls under, obviously, research, education, with a dash of communication, and we hope that you have access to our extension partners. What's not listed on this screen are our strategic plan focus areas, and that's also mentioned in the announcement, but I'll talk about them, and I'm sure Sam will go into them a little bit later as well. But we work with workforce development and environmental, environmental literacy, resilient coastal communities and economies, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, and healthy coastal ecosystems and communities. So the research, outreach, education, and communication conducted by fellows must address those focal areas and goals of the Virginia Sea Grant Strategic Plan. Uh, but you can view that strategic plan on our website. Uh, again, it would take quite a bit of time for us to dive deep into that. And again, I hope that you have read our announcement. Um, and we'll get more into this a little later on as well. So the Graduate Research Fellowship that we offer at Virginia Sea Grant has some advantages that you might not find in every fellowship program. So we invest in people, and this fellowship is primarily an investment in your future, and having academic experiences or expenses covered is great, 
But what we really want is for our fellows to grow into the professionals who will have lasting impacts on the Commonwealth's coast economy and communities, right? So how do we do that, right? We do that through professional development training opportunities. And if you have visited our website, which I hope you have, you can see some of the things that we have done in the past. What you will not find on our website, however, is a list of all of the things that you can expect to do in the professional development realm. And why is that? It's because we like to tailor our approach. And so in order to do that, I have to know what fellows want. And as students join, they create something we know call as an individual development plan, which you may have heard of those before. And really you'll work with your academic advisor and your mentor to create that. And that's gonna help inform what opportunities we provide you. Also this fellowship will offer you a chance to interact with a professional mentor, as you have seen. You need to have someone who can action what you're doing and help connect you with their networks as well. And that was identified as a best management practice from the National Sea Grant Office. And that's why it's a big component of your application. Also through us, you'll have access to a growing network of coastal and marine scientists, extension staff and stakeholders. And you all will, or whoever we fund will become part of our growing cohort and we hope that everyone will continue to contribute to Virginia Sea Grant. So here are some sort of logistics about the fellowship program. So the 2022 research fellowship program will start in September of 2022, specifically September 1st. And you see here in parentheses, it says up to two years. And the reason we say up to two years is because you do not have to request two years of funding. You can do a year or a year and a half. It really is gonna depend on your graduation timeline and your project. We fund up to 40,000 per year and it requires a 50% match. And that match source is going to vary. It often comes from waived IDC or your advisor salary, as an example. So who is eligible for this fellowship? So if you are enrolled in a Virginia institution of higher education in a graduate professional or PhD program, and you are conducting Virginia relevant research or evidence-based inquiry, you are eligible. Now you might hear Sea Grant, marine science, fisheries, and think, well, I'm an engineer or an architect or in public health, and so maybe this isn't the opportunity for me. And we say that we can't reach our goals, which I mentioned earlier, if we don't have diversity in disciplines and thinking. And we welcome you to consider how your research or inquiry fits into those strategic plan focal areas. So Sam, you wanna give us some examples or provide some context here? As Michelle mentioned earlier, we have four different strategic focal areas for our program. They align with the National Sea Grant College Program and the majority of other Sea Grant programs across the nation. They're generally fairly broad, and a few of those and some examples to consider. If you're working in coastal Virginia on aquaculture fishery species, we have a focus area that's specifically targeted for safe and sustainable seafood and aquaculture. So it's kind of easy to envision how your research would fit into that focal area. A lot of people that are working within the resiliency space are coming from a diversity of disciplines. This might be public policy, law, engineering, natural sciences as well, especially for living shoreline and nature-based features and solutions. So within that, there's a lot of different research that might be eligible in that area. We find that healthy coastal ecosystems is probably the broadest in terms of the different types of projects that could be proposed and linked to it. Um, so if you have any questions about how your research might fit within one of those focus areas, um, it's probably easiest to schedule a time to talk to us, whether it's towards the end of this webinar or maybe during one of the virtual open office hours that we're hosting as well. Um, usually the people that have questions are doing offshore research or transatlantic species or something like that. Um, and a lot of times they find that those projects are related to species in the Commonwealth or that come by the Commonwealth during different transient periods. But if it's helpful for you to kind of talk through and think about whether or not it's relevant within Virginia Sea Grants focus areas before you apply, we welcome you to reach out to us to have those conversations. Anything else, Michelle, that you want to hit on? No, thanks, Sam. And again, we will have virtual open office hours, and I'll be sure that everyone here has the links to that. They'll be due two more before the application is due 
And so next Friday, October 29th, and then Friday, November 5th, we'll have office hours as well. You're also free to email us, but some most of the questions that we've been getting are easier to answer in a forum like this or in the office hours. So if you email us, we may just say, hey, catch us during those office hours, but you're still welcome to do that as well. The Graduate Research Fellowship. What are the goals? So like I said earlier, we invest in people and we're looking for students with potential who will benefit from being a fellow who will benefit professionally from having access to a mentor into our network, our extension partners, et cetera. So we support graduate students engaged in education and research that aligns with our mission, like we said, and we really want students to get a hands-on experience in translating what they're doing to stakeholders. And the professional mentor is a huge component of that. And it is actually, uh, that relationship has a heavy weight as we're considering your application. And as I mentioned, the professional development training opportunities now, I want to hear from our fellows what they want. I'll try to come up with some things, but really, you all have an idea of what you want to do, and I want to support that. So, there are a couple things that are new this year. Again, if you have applied in the past, this application is going to look different from what you did before. I see a question on the Jamboard, actually, that asks if having applied in the past or applying again, if you weren't selected for, and that's going to hurt your chances. No, it won't. But you'll also notice that this application looks different from something that you did before. So the first thing that's new and of importance is registration in the C grant before the application is due. So the application itself is due on November 19th, but we require that you log into EC grant and complete a short form by November 10th. Okay. So before you also had to write a narrative. And now we have changed that into an applicant form. So the professional development statement now offers you a chance to respond to three of five prompts. And we have restricted the character limit because we really want you to be succinct and focused on what you wanna do. Okay. Um, we also now have recommendation forms and a mentor form. So instead of going to your academic advisor and to a professional referee, to get them to write a letter, which we all know have varying degrees of detail. And sometimes they're, they're not always ask, answering the questions that we really want to know the answers to. Um, so we have created forms through EC Grant where they respond to a variety of prompts as well. Some folks have asked us, do our academic advisors and mentors have to have their own EC Grant account in order to create this form? And the answer is no. In your application, an EC grant, and Sam, I think we'll go through some of that a little bit later, you'll see a section where you go in and enter their information, they get sent a link, and they will be able to fill out a form and it will get attached to your application. It's, it's a pretty simple process. Um, also, for the professional mentor, there's a form for them as well. Before, they had to write a letter explaining how they were going to contribute. And again, we tried to make this easier and a little more equitable across applicants by creating a form. Um, so with that, please note in the announcement the kinds of questions that we're going to be asking on that form. And it's really okay to kind of coach your referees on some things that they wanna answer because we know that some folks know you better than others. And as you're developing these relationships with the professional mentors, they don't have the historical knowledge that your academic advisor or a professional reference does. And if you're newer in your program, maybe your academic advisor hasn't gotten a chance to get to know you as well as folks who are further along in their academic career. And so start talking to those folks early and again, reference the announcement to know what we're gonna be asking them because they may have questions for you as well. We've also updated the project narrative. And I saw a question about um, sort of the level of detail for the outreach plan because that narrative, it's only two pages, but we're asking you to give us your <laughs> research uh, methodology and also explaining your outreach plan. Um, Sam, I'm going to kick this over to you really quickly, because I know during office hours, 
folks ask some really good questions about how do we give a sufficient level of detail about our research in two pages and also give you what our outreach plan will be. Yeah, it's uh, in many ways, it is almost a practice of your communication ability, especially at a two page level for this year as it's been reduced a little bit more. Um, the most important thing probably to keep in mind from the onset is the fact that you're writing a proposal, in this case, that is about you. It's not necessarily focused on your research. Instead, it's focused on this professional mentorship and outreach kind of extension component of what you're doing as your graduate program as part of this fellowship. So with that in mind, the research piece is really going to be more of an introduction where you're referencing it probably most likely at the beginning. You're going to make links to those strategic focus areas for Virginia Sea Grant that I talked about a little bit earlier. You want to be able to hit on at least one of those, if not multiple, and there's usually multiple ones that you can link to for your project. And then pretty quickly, you're going to make that transition to the other aspects of that narrative that you need to include. And like I mentioned before, that's really focusing on the professional mentorship and the outreach components that you're proposing to do as part of your fellowship. So that is different. We acknowledge it as different than a lot of other fellowship programs. You're probably not picking up other materials that you've submitted for other fellowship programs or submitted to your committee for your thesis or dissertation, um, but rather thinking about that proposal a little bit differently and reflecting on you, the individual. Thank you, Sam. Also new this year is the updated evaluation rating. And so what that means is we have changed the value of certain components of the application. You'll notice that we don't ask for transcripts anymore. We haven't found necessarily that the transcripts are a great predictive indicator of who's going to be a successful fellow. And because of that, we didn't ask for it this year. And so we're focusing more on your potential than what you've done in the past. So the CV is going to be important. And really, the candidate interview is 45% of the evaluation criteria in the final stage. And so that's when you talk to folks here at Virginia Sea Grant, and we try to dive a little deeper into who you are. Um, so the relevance of your project obviously is important, but again, we're investing in people and not necessarily your research. So while this is called a graduate research fellowship, you'll notice there's slightly less emphasis on that in this round and also in our evaluation of the application. And for folks who are used to more pure science and more technical applications, this might be a bit of a stretch, but we hope that we've made it a little simpler for you by the use of forms and being very specific in what we want to know about you. And we did this for equity reasons. Um, we're hoping that if you don't have to write sort of a science proper paper that folks who may not have accessed this before will feel more comfortable in this application process. So that's what's new with the graduate research fellowship application process if you have applied before and are looking this year. And if this is all brand new to you, well, great. It's brand new to us too. <laughs> We try to make this application as painless as possible. We do know that we're asking a lot, but we're trying to provide guidance here that you need. So lots of people have questions about this fellow and mentor relationship. We have a document on our website that will give you some sort of tips that will really dive deeper into the goals of that relationship and talk about the expectations of it and how you go about uh, potentially seeking out that partnership. Okay. Um, I see that we have a couple of mentorship questions and we'll, we'll get to those later because I know that it can be a daunting task in a few weeks to ask you to find someone who's going to really enhance your application and serve as a mentor to you. We also have budget and budget justification document. I don't see any questions currently on the Jamboard regarding that. Um, budgets, I think, are sometimes scary for those of us who don't always work with numbers, but we have the guidance out there and we're always here to answer questions because you have them. Um, again, there's the data sharing plan and EC grant instructions. Um, you know, for those of us who use EC grant all the time, we think it's 
pretty intuitive, but for those who haven't used it, we can see where maybe it's not always so clear. So there are instructions. Thank you, Sam, our resident EC grant expert on creating those instructions to help our applicants. And we also have some templates. You don't have to create the wheel and create the wheel, right? So the title page, we give you a template for that. So you can answer exactly what we're looking for. We also have an Excel budget sheet that help that will help you create that budget and create some consistency. Ooh, how specific should each portion of our budget be? Ah, so we do have a budget question. All right, we'll get to that in our Q&A section as well. Okay. So if you wanna learn more, which I hope you do, I hope this isn't your first time hearing about our website, uh, but go check that out and see some stories and testimonials of previous fellows, current fellows, and to see the professional development opportunities that we have had and may even have in the future if there's something there that really interests our fellows, okay? So what you probably came for, tips for applicants, okay? So you see this top one here says, consider a referee who can contribute a diverse perspective on who you are. So we have two recommendation forms. So your academic recommendation, that will come from your advisor. If you have more than one advisor, they will need to complete just one form. So ideally in EC Grant, you will um, send them both a notification, but talk to them so that they only fill out the form once from both of them, okay? So again, and then you have your professional reference, which is not the same as your professional mentor. Okay, so this is somebody outside of academia who knows you from a different perspective. And as you're thinking of the person to fill out that form, again, someone who knows you and who knows you outside of academia is really what we're looking for. Who's gonna be able to speak to who you are and what you can do from a different perspective, okay? So Sam, did you wanna add, feel free to jump in and add anything as we're going through this if you think of something that um, is helpful for folks to know, okay? So again, if you, I saw you move in there. So again, hopefully you have all reviewed the announcement and you will go and to our website and look at the fellow mentor relationship. And really, as you're considering who will serve as that mentor, there was a question here is, should that mentor be somebody outside of the university? We can't tell you who to select. And Sam, did you want to jump in here? I saw you on mute. Yeah, I... Um... I'm going to build on what Michelle, I think, was getting ready to say a little bit and just say there's no limitation who your mentor can be. Um, do pay particular attention to the evaluation criteria. And this is one of those times where it's helpful to think like a reviewer. Um, so if, for instance, you're choosing somebody that is a faculty member, especially if they're in your department or school, it might be worth thinking about how they currently are supporting you or are not. Um, as part of your graduate program. So if they're on your thesis or dissertation committee and they're putting that in their responses or there's reference to it, the review panel might ask a question like, well, how by this person serving as a mentor, professional mentor on this fellowship program, how is that gonna further support the student's professional growth? And what other opportunities are they gonna have access to that they wouldn't have had even though the person was already on their committee? So those might be the kind of considerations that you want to think about in advance when you're thinking about different mentors. Um, a lot of times affiliation, especially if it's the same university, might lead that person and maybe you as the applicant to highlight some of those additional ways that by serving in this role as professional mentor through the fellowship, they'll give you access to a broader network. There's other types of outreach or extension events that you'll have access to that you wouldn't have had to during your normal graduate program, things you're building upon your experience with. So those are some of the considerations to think about if it's somebody that has a very similar line in their university signature as what you would have within your own. Thank you, Sam. And 35% of the criteria in this third stage is about the professional potential and impact. And that is really driven by that professional mentor relationship. So we can't, like I was saying, we can't tell you who to have as your mentor, but we are going to consider how much of an impact this person is gonna have 
I'll say it, I think, for the third time now. We invest in people, and this fellowship is really about professional growth. And so we want that person to help you grow. And so if, if it seems like an applicant chose somebody for convenience and we can't quite make the connection on how they're going to benefit from that relationship, as Sam was saying, that might impact how we evaluate that application. Um, and you're gonna wanna work with this person to develop that narrative where you talk about the kind of outreach that you can do through this fellowship as well. You're gonna to wanna to reflect also on your short and your long-term professional goals because we do specifically ask those questions. What are your short-term goals? What are your long-term professional goals? Now, as a professional development coordinator, I know that you don't necessarily know exactly what you wanna do in your career and that as you get access to opportunities, your plans and ideas change and that is completely fine. You know, we're not going to look back at your application later and say, well, you said that in five years you were going to be working for NOAA and now you're going to work for a nonprofit. So, no, this, is, this doesn't track. Um, so just be mindful that this is really about trying to get you to the next step of your career beyond academia. Uh, or even if you're going to stay in academia, you know, how does this person get you the experience that you need to be successful on that career path? And so you wanna start talking to folks early. If you haven't pinpointed anyone, we know that this deadline is coming up pretty soon and it does seem daunting. How in a few weeks am I gonna choose someone, get them to agree to mentor me, create this plan with me. Um, folks do it every year and, and we believe in you. You know, you can do it. Um, so also, regardless of our deadline, know that your office of sponsored programs may have their own internal deadlines and if you want to get something to us, let's say on November 19th, they might want something in their office 14 days earlier. So please pay attention to your internal deadlines and make sure that you are giving the folks who need to help you move your application forward ample time. Any tips or tricks there, Sam? Um, I will say that yeah, sometimes brownies and other things come in really handy uh, when we're talking to OSP people. I'm, I'm only saying that half jokingly, um, but do reach out to them early. And if you have a business manager in your department that you're gonna be working with, let them know you're planning to apply, work with your academic advisor to kind of make that introduction if you don't know them already. That way they know that you have a proposal under development. They can let you know what materials that they need to see in advance of you hitting submit on the deadline or hopefully before. We always recommend submitting early, um, definitely not within the hour of the deadline. Um, a day or two early can be really nice, but find out internally when everything needs to be done, what they need to review. It won't include a lot of the elements that you're gonna be working towards. And that'll just make your life a lot simpler as you're working through things. It means that you probably will wanna have the budget and the narrative done, but your personal goal responses might be something that you can save until the last week or two before, before you start to finalize those things. So you can be strategic in this. Um, and with that, we do have a few different people. I think audience is kind of on this call at the moment. So we do hear from people that are helping students put together fellowship applications that are on different university campuses across the state. So there may be a contact like that on this meeting that is from your university, or there might be somebody out there that serves in that capacity. So ask around too. They may have tips, tricks, and example documents in addition to what we're sharing today that'll help you put together your application. Thank you, Sam. And I'm glad to see more questions popping up in the Jamboard, especially about the mentor. And we will get to all of those questions as well. So you noticed at the beginning of this presentation in that grid that we also mentioned the NIMS Sea Grant Fellowship. Sam, I'm gonna kick it over to you one more time. Uh, can you set that up? I was reading one of the questions, my apologies. <laughs> yep, yep, just wanna tell them a little bit about another graduate research fellowship opportunity, oh. the NIMS Sea Grant Fellowship. Sounds good. And I think you may need to advance your slide or at least I'm not seeing the NIMS one on there currently. Do you not? 
Let's see it on my screen. Let me try this one more time. Do you see it now? I don't, but I can probably go off of memory. But for everyone else, maybe uh, one of the participants, if you can chime in and just let us know if you're seeing one that says National Marine Fisheries Sea Grant Fellowship at the moment. Still seeing the Graduate Research Fellowship Fellowship Goals slide on my screen, at least. Thank you. Okay, I'm advancing. Yeah. Um, or, or, has anybody seen me clicking through slides? No, unfortunately. Okay, so let me stop share. Can you guys still hear me? Yep. Mm, my screen has gone white. Everyone, if you can give us one minute, Michelle, I will pull it up on my computer and I'll share. Great. Thank you, Sam. And as we were viewing it, um, that was the last slide that I saw and it sounds like everybody else too. So. We will put up the last two slides, um, just so everybody can see the content that was kind of on those. Michelle did a great job of talking through it and kind of sharing all of the details with you as we went, but just so you can see the slides as well, I'll put those up. So, um, and Michelle, can you just let me know if you're seeing the slide? Or Jay? I'm still seeing, now I'm seeing the slide with uh, fellowship goals with Amon and Alfonso on it. Try this a different way. How about now? Yeah, that's better. Um, so Michelle did a real quick overview of this, but you heard her talking about all the different tips, the guidance documents, um, some of these considerations that are on here, um, reflecting on short and long-term goals and talking to your sponsor programs contacts. So she was going through most of those tips. Those came off of this slide. The program that she was kicking it to me for was another fellowship program that Virginia Sea Grant administers. This is the National Marine Fisheries Sea Grant, National Sea Grant Joint Fellowship Program. Now there's one application process for this fellowship program, and there are actually two different opportunities kind of embedded within it. So you can see those two opportunities outlined down at the bottom. The first is very much a quantitative fisheries program. Um, is population and ecosystem dynamics. Now, traditionally, this is an opportunity where future stock assessment researchers that want to go to work for NOAA, work at one of the fishery science centers, um, are doing some type of modeling or population estimates. This is a program that's kind of tailored a little bit for them. And the other opportunity is focused on marine resource economics. Now, with that, there have been a number of past successful applicants that are studying social science, um, doing like more of social science surveys about preference and industry participation that kind of fall into that too. So that one may actually be a little bit broader than how you would read it. And if you're interested in either of these opportunities, you're welcome to reach out to us. Um, to ask if your research falls within the eligibility requirements for these programs. Now, they are limited to PhD students. The program has changed over the last two years since last time we hosted one of these webinars, actually. And the funding amount has gone up. So it is a lot higher than it was in previous years. Um, and it is for three years for either the Population Ecosystem Dynamics Fellows or the Marine Resource Economics Fellows. Um, now the NOFO reads that they're taking um, and will be supporting about, or a minimum, 
of four fellows for the 2022 program. With that, they traditionally do go a little bit higher than that. And the state of Virginia has put forward and had a lot of successful applicants over the last 10 years. So if you're interested in the program, please do feel free to reach out to us about this. The deadline for the fellowship program is not until January of 2022. So you have some time for this opportunity if you're just finding out about it. I went ahead and advanced to the next slide, which has the deadlines that Michelle was talking about and we'll capture here in a second. But with that program, like I said, reach out to us, let us know if you have questions. Comparatively to the fellowship program Michelle just talked about, there are a lot more application elements and there are some standard kind of NOAA requirements that come with this one. So we can be here as a little bit of a support structure to help you um, think through all those different application elements, provide some additional resources. And all of this fellowship program will be updated on our website, along with guidance templates, documents, and other things within about the next week. And you'll be receiving a notification email for it being up there in the next two weeks. So keep an eye out for all of those resources and information. Michelle, do you want to hop back in to, to talk about deadlines and other tips? Yes. Again, as a reminder, we are requiring a registration and EC grant this year by November 10th. There's a short form for you to complete. It's not just creating an EC grant account. There's also starting that application and filling out the registration form. And it's very short and you can update it anytime before November 10th. So even if you just put some filler text in now, just to make sure that you get it started, um, we just know that you need that by November 10th. And then the application itself is due on November 19th. That is a Friday by 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And so if you give us your application at 5.01, <laughs> you have officially missed the deadline. So it is important not only to put in your elements into a secret, but to actually be sure that your application has been submitted and you will know that it has been submitted because you will receive an email indicating that it has been submitted and received by us. Again, the fellowship starts on September 1st of 2022. Sam, did you have something? I saw a hand. I didn't know if that was a, a general. So just again, a, just a reminder that while your application elements have to be in by 5 p.m., your advisor and mentor and any other letter writers information also has to be submitted by that 5 p.m. deadline. So this can be a good opportunity to uh, manage from the middle a little bit with your application materials and just make sure that they get their materials in on time. Yes, and with NEC grant, when you go to submit the form to send them an email to ask them to complete the recommendation forms for you, you can request a deadline for that. Doesn't mean they have to honor it, but you can give them a deadline. And so maybe, you know, you have that friend that always shows up 30 minutes late. So you kind of fudge a little bit about what time the party's starting, you know, maybe consider doing that with your recommenders as well. Uh, give them, give them a few days early in case they don't get it done. You can make sure that you hit that November 19th, 5 p.m deadline. You would hate for somebody to not have an opportunity because a recommender didn't meet that time as well. And just one more time, make sure you're talking to your office of sponsored programs or your research office, whatever it's called on your campus, to make sure that you are meeting internal deadlines for them to run your application through as well. And you are in control of the slides now. Okay. So we have talked so much about EC Grant. What is EC Grant? It is our online portal for which you will use to submit your application. Again, make sure you register <laughs> early. Sam, do you want to take over the EC Grant portion here? Yep, and I can knock out one or two questions kind of as we go. I am going to share my screen. I am logged in as Michelle, so you get to see exactly what she sees when she goes in as well. Um, there are a couple questions already about, it says the PI should be the one who registers in EC Grant. For a fellowship proposal, the student is the PI. Note that the system will allow you to add delegates, and then I can do that as well. If you email me 
or Michelle or the VASG at virginiacgrant.org email address. So if a sponsor programs contact, your academic advisor, other PI that will serve on this award um, would like to be added to that application, we can do all of those things and add multiple people to it. Um, once you register and you log into the system, you will see a current tasks kind of homepage, which is what you're seeing right now on the screen. Uh, you will just click the add proposal button. At that point, you can title it if you haven't already. And once you go into the system and have started your application, you'll see the title that you've named it. And on the left hand side, you will see kind of the sequence of all the different application elements and steps that you need to complete in order to submit your proposal. We've got a number of things kind of listed out here for um, actually the fellowship announcement in terms of instructions that kind of help you. But please do remember the fellowship announcement that is on our website is what you should refer to for all of the detailed instructions. This is basically a shorter version of that just to kind of be helpful. Once you go down through the registration information is the date that Michelle referenced that is November 10th, where the responses in this form, the ones with red circles do have to be completed by that date. So please remember that this one does have to be done early. Um, as you go down through all of the different forms on the left hand side, a lot of these just allow you to select a file, upload by hitting save, and then you can move on to the next form and you can check them off or mark them as complete as you go. The most important part, and this is how you hit submit, is when you get to the submission preview form at the very end, you can check everything over, see everything that's been uploaded, all your responses in here. The submit button in the upper right hand corner, you do have to click that button to submit your fellowship application. It's not enough just to upload all of your elements and responses. You do have to click, click submit and you have to do that by 5 p.m. on the deadline. Michelle, I am trying to read over some of the other questions that are coming in, but if there's an EC grant question I'm not seeing at the moment, please let me know and I'll address that while I'm in here too. Yep, it is a question about, um, it says only PI should register, but you answered that by saying that for the EC grant purposes, students or the applicant is considered the PI. Okay. Um, one note, if you do have any issues um, as you register, as you're going through, there's a multi-step registration process where it will text you or call you to give you um, a couple confirmations as you go through multi-factor or authentication. Um, if you have issues with that, let us know. Behind the scenes, we can add you and a username for you with whatever email address you prefer and get you into the system a little bit quicker if that helps. So just let us know if you need some assistance there. If you're not getting an email or you don't get a phone call or something like that for some reason. Michelle, do you want to transition to a Q&A session at this point? Sure, but before we do that, just as a quick reminder here, our website, the EC Grant portal, and our contact email address. I think we need that. And we can advance. I think it's just it's a slide that says questions. So we get to that. All right. So I'm going to start with the general grant writing questions. Okay. So our first one Should you target the application on a small piece of a larger dissertation or attempt to include the entire research program? Um, Sam, I'm going to kick that to you as our resident research guy. Yeah, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but just to kind of recap, we recognize that within two pages, you're not going to talk about all of your research, and it's not the focus of this fellowship program. So do include a little bit about your research, a paragraph or more as appropriate to frame the relevancy and how that aligns with the Virginia Sea Grant focus areas and then make that transition into the outreach and professional development aspects of what you're proposing to do as part of the fellowship program. I think we touched on this, but the level of detail that we want for the outreach plan. So again, we give you two pages to accomplish a lot. And frankly, most of it will probably be about that outreach plan. Now we still need to be able to evaluate 
if your research uh, methodologies are good, but we don't need the full scientific thing. Um, so the level of detail for the outreach plan, um, that's gonna depend on you, <laughs> really. Um, Sam, I don't know if there's, there's more I can say about that. Yeah, it generally depends on what you're proposing too. Um, if you're, and, and think carefully about what you're proposing, you have two years or at least up to two years worth of time and this is not a full-time job. So with that, we recognize you're building on your graduate research activities or the projects that you're doing as part of your graduate program. Um, generally, what we find is that students are proposing maybe two or three kind of solid things that they're doing with their outreach professional mentors. Those run the gamut in terms of activities, whether they're creating lesson plans, they're working on communication projects, et cetera. Like they, they really do run the gamut. So look at our, website and some of the stories that we have about our current and former fellows to get some ideas and inspiration and tailor that to you. And like we said before, reflecting your own professional goals. Um, but you want to put enough detail within those activities that an external can, reviewer can tell that you've kind of done your homework, that you know what level of preparation and what your goals are with any activity that you're describing. And then that fits within the timeline of the graduate activities you're proposing. So if you want to do a presentation kind of about the results of your research to a series of community members and stakeholders, you probably don't want to do that, you know, in the middle of your fellowship program when you still have a year to go. So think carefully about when you're aiming to do some of those activities. Um, I, and with that, yep, I think, the level of detail is variable. Note that there are other application elements, like the responses that your mentor will be submitting, that if you're thinking holistically about your application process, you know, the whole package, your advisor and your mentor might include some additional details within their materials that can build upon or reflect some of the other things that you have in your two pages. So you're not necessarily capped at two pages for your entire package. It's just that you might think holistically about what's included where. Thank you. So another question we have here is clarifying the professional recommendation. This letter is not coming from your professional mentor. Um, is it coming from someone who can give their input? So we talked about this a little bit earlier. So there is the academic recommendation, the professional recommendation, and then the professional mentor form. So the professional recommendation is not the same as the professional mentor form. So think of it in terms of you have two letters of recommendation that are a bit prescriptive from us, and that's gonna be your academic advisor and then your, the prof, we call it the professional recommendation. And that's somebody who knows you outside of academia. So that could be maybe a former employer or, um, you know, a colleague that you've worked with in the past, somebody that can speak to your experiences outside of the academy. Now your professional mentor, I can see how we use the word professional so much that maybe we're reaching linguistic satiety with it at this point, what does it even mean? Um, but you know, those, are, those are two different people, right? Uh, so there's also a question here about the DEI statement. So thank you for bringing this up, whoever wrote that question, because I meant to reference it earlier. So that is also new. We have a diversity statement and it's just 300 words. And really, what do we want to see in that? So somebody who hasn't written one before, um, we just wanna know what makes you unique. And when we say diversity, that has a huge broad meaning. And so whatever that term means to you and what you think makes you unique and how you are gonna contribute a new perspective, that's what you wanna hear in that statement. Um, so have fun with that, be creative. So is it safe to assume that reviewers have a working knowledge of organisms and issues in Virginia coastal waters? So you will notice from the announcement that there is a three-stage review process. And so the very first thing we have is our external advisory committee and our key stakeholders, they review the applications for the scientific, technical, and outreach relevance to Sea Grant and Virginia. 
among some other things. So folks on that review will absolutely have a knowledge of organisms and issues in Virginia coastal waters. Now, once you get down to the third stage where people like me are there to interview you, no, I don't know anything about Virginia coastal waters, but the folks before me will make sure that what you have is solid. So a question here, is it helpful for applicants to include the exact phrasing of VASG strategic goal areas in the project narrative? I'm going to say yes, make it very clear how you are connecting. And sort of like when you're applying for a job and you start using the keywords from the job description to make sure that the folks know that you're on the same page, do that in your application as well. Make it a very exact, distinct link to our goals here. So there's another question in the general grant about tables and figures are not included in the page link. Should these be included at the end or embedded in the text of the document? That is a great question. Sam, uh, you have more experience with this. You want to chime in? Yep. Generally, it's easier if you include them as page three and page four. You can reference them as figure one, figure two. Um, that will assure that there's no question of whether or not you've exceeded the page limit. I'm going to move over to mentorship questions. I think this is probably the one that has most applicants. I don't want to say nervous, but this is probably a new ask for folks. Okay. So the best way for applicants to obtain a mentor. Um, so start thinking about what you want to get out of the fellowship, how you want to grow professionally. Maybe consider somebody who is going to fill in a gap or introduce you to a network of people you might not otherwise have access to. Um, as we said before, we can't tell you exactly who should serve as your mentor, and just kind of give you some tips on, on choosing that person. So talk to your advisor and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing for outreach or for um, you know, an, an area that I wanna grow in. Do you have any ideas or can you start pointing me in the right direction? Sam, I think you started hitting on this earlier as well about choosing a mentor because there's a question here about, you know, how, what do you do also if you need help identifying a professional mentor? Yeah, I, I guess holistically, we have seen an evolution within our program of the types of mentors that fellows work with. Originally, when we developed the program, we actually had it listed as an outreach mentor and students were working with people that could basically translate their research to a stakeholder base. That might be research to a lesson plan for a K-12 audience, but that might be research to a two-pager to take it up to Capitol Hill. So the transition has been focused more on the students themselves and their professional growth. So are there opportunities for somebody externally potentially to come in? To inform you about research needs or how your research might inform management decisions. Are there professional skills you want to gain? Maybe you want to work at NOAA and run a program in the future or work for a state agency. Can you have a mentor from one of those different types of positions that's currently there that can talk to you about the skills and the experience that you need to successfully walk into one of those programs and help you gain that experience over time? So, you notice there's kind of two aspects there. There's the translation of your results to a stakeholder audience. That's one type of mentorship that's professional. And there's another one, which is your own professional development. And you can pursue any of those, which means it's different types of mentors. So talk to your advisors, talk to people in your network. You can look at our website for who people have partnered with in the past to gain some inspiration and think about stakeholders and, and researchers across the state and beyond. An important note is they don't have to be located in Virginia. We have seen very successful mentor mentee relationships, especially as we all get used to working in a virtual environment that can be outside the city that you are currently in, outside the state even, or participating regionally. And you meet them at conferences, you find other ways to engage, and those can be extremely valuable. So, so don't feel like you have to work with somebody because they're close or you already know them. Michelle, I want to take one second because I think um, there was an element of one of the general grant writing questions that I may have missed. Um, and that was a question that we do receive a lot. How much of your research should be targeted 
for your proposal, and I interpreted it a different way initially, but the important point that I want to make is this is a two-year fellowship program, and your actual outreach and professional mentorship activities might not relate to all four chapters of PhD dissertation. That's fine. You're proposing activities that you can do within two years. You may only be writing a proposal that's really taking the advantage of one chapter or maybe two chapters of your master's or PhD program. You do not have to propose your entire degree program and everything that you're working on as part of this fellowship program. Propose the piece that's most relevant to the program and what you're proposing to do. Thank you, Sam. I'm gonna jump quickly to the budget question just to make sure that that question was answered. It was asking about the specificity of the budget and you can get all of that from that budget document on our website. I will tell you exactly what you need to include. Do you know that different universities will have different requirements beyond that? But for a Virginia Sea Grant level of detail, that's what we need. And so back to the mentorship questions, there is one that says, it sounds like we assume that you would work more with your mentor than your advisor. Is this correct? So I guess you were gonna work with your advisor as much as you need to for your academic program, right? You know, that, that's still ongoing. And the Graduate Research Fellowship is something that I guess you could almost consider extracurricular from academics. So in terms of this fellowship, the relationship with that professional mentor is probably going to be more important to us than all the work that you do with your advisor. So the actual amount of time that you work with that professional mentor is going to vary by fellow and what works for your project and your outreach and the time that your professional mentor has as well. As long as you guys agree on you know, a mutually beneficial cycle of communication, that um, that's going to vary. So you're gonna work with your advisor as much as you're gonna work with your advisor and your professional mentor as often as is necessary to get the proposed work done. Um, will it hurt the applicant's chances if their proposed mentor has agreed to mentor more than one fellow? No, it will not. What's really important is how you individually plan to work with that mentor. We did have a mentor reach out to ask the question about serving as a professional mentor to more than one student. And we said, as long as they can you know, be helpful and grow those students and have the time to do it, it doesn't matter to us how many students they mentor, as long as you can clearly articulate how this person is going to help you in a professional context. It would be kind of odd if we saw the exact same plan for two different applications. <laughs> So just make sure that even if you and another fellow have the same mentor, that your plans are unique to you. Um, I think we already answered choosing a mentor outside of the university. Again, that's gonna depend on your goals. We do have a student now whose mentor actually is on their university uh, campus, but they're in a completely different context from their academic work, and it makes perfect sense for what we're proposing to do. So again, don't just go for the low hanging fruit and the easiest you know, mentor, but if there is someone who you know already who's a great option, don't say, no, I, I can't do it because they're on my university campus, Sam. And that's a great grant writing tip to, to kind of build upon. Sometimes it is easier for an advisor or a mentor to make that point than to you, for you to use the space that you have in your proposal to make that point. So think about how your academic advisor might point out that the relationship you're developing with a mentor and their responses can, is different than what you would normally have access to. And it builds upon what you're doing as part of your graduate program. Um, and, a traditional example for other fellowship programs, not as relevant for this one anymore, but if you got a really bad grade in your undergraduate program, but there was a really good reason that that happened that semester, that's where an advisor can kind of speak to that and the fact that you overcame that obstacle or barrier at some point in your career. And that negative could turn into a positive, but it comes better from an advisor or mentor framing that for you. 
And the good news is we won't see those undergraduate transcripts. <laughs> but yes, in general, for other grants, consider what Sam just said as well. So under our other questions, is there a specific weight given to each application component or is it evaluated holistically? So you will know exactly the weight given to components if you look through the announcement. And if stage one, there's no waiting, they're just making sure that technically your application makes sense and is relevant to Virginia. And once you get to stage two of the review, you'll see that the strength of the academic and professional performance you know, is evidenced by your CV and other applications. That's 25%. So academic and professional potential at that stage is 40%. And professional mentor relationship is 20. Outreach plan is 15. Um, so Yes, we are looking at the application as a whole, but there is different value for each section, depending on the stage of the review. And as I mentioned earlier, and we'll say again, once you get to stage three, where you're gonna be having the candidate interview with folks here at Sea Grant, that's gonna have a greater weight than your potential and the relevance of your project at that stage, because those things have been evaluated a couple of times before, and yes, they're still important at that stage, but they don't have the same weight. Okay. Um, let's see, the other questions I think have been pretty much answered in the Jamboard. Will it hurt my application if my professional reference is also academic? So not the current advisor, but an advisor from undergrad. Um, no, because they still know you in a different context and hopefully they can speak to that professional experience. As long as they're not speaking to the same experience as your actual academic reference, you know, that shouldn't hurt you. And we do recognize that sometimes not every student has a wealth of professional experience at this point and you've, you've got to rely on who you know, and that's okay. Um, man, a master's student that gets the Virginia Sea Grant Fellowship Award bypassed to a PhD and continue with the award, or is that not allowed? Sam. Yes, if you are planning to bypass, um, obviously you'll have to submit a budget and other elements that might reference that, but may be required to be submitted as a master's student and not at the level of like a PhD candidate. Um, but you can submit as long as you are staying in the same program. If you were to graduate from the master's degree program and then go into a PhD program, you could not continue it forward into a new degree with a new thesis or a, at least a different thesis set of chapters, for instance. So it can go through as a bypass, but ask us if you have questions about that based on your own program, because they are all different. We have answered all but one question here, and Hadi, I believe that is yours, and that is very specific, and we, if you will hang on at the end. Or, you know. Just one, um, I think I was putting the response in, Michelle, as you were talking about one of the others. There was a question about EC grant notifications. A couple quick things on that. Yes, when, they, when your mentor or advisor hits submit, you will get a notification. It will not confirm if they entered all of their responses. Um, or completed everything. So do double check with them on those things, but it will let you know. It will also send reminders to you as the deadline approaches, since you've all started applications, or at least for those of you who have, and it will send reminders to them, the, rec the recommenders, um, as they approach their own deadline, which may be different if you set it up to be different than the actual application deadline. Um, that being said, sometimes those go and get hit by spam filters or go to junk folders, et cetera. So follow up with all of your contacts to make sure that they're receiving everything and that they've submitted everything. Don't rely on anything system or the mentors as you're approaching those deadlines. Um, we, we don't wanna get emails from you afterwards uh, with the unfortunate I thought everyone had submitted, but I just found out because it's heartbreaking for us and you, you more than us, but we still don't like it when that happens. So we wanna make sure that you get everything in and have full eligibility to apply for the program. Um, I will say, let's say that you ask a professional recommender for a recommendation and they're not getting to it in time and you've pinged them a few times, if you have someone else who could get it done faster, that's okay too. You're not 
you know, locked in once you send somebody an email as well. So, yeah. So I think you're going to wrap us up. So let me know if you want me to put the PowerPoint back up for any closing thoughts on that. But I'll also note that I've been trying to capture some of what Michelle's saying and some of our program's recommendations within the Jamboard. So you will see VASG dash a response for the easier answers in here. Um, Jay will be putting this recording up on the website and sending everything out via social media and the website. So know that those responses are there um, and Michelle will kind of carry us forward. But I just want to make sure that you all knew that some of this information is already in there and can be referenced. Thank you, Sam. The ECHO, we are available on Friday, October 29th and Friday, November 5th from 2 to 3 for office hours. If you have more questions, I will send that link out to everyone who is here. And again, if you have more questions after this, we are available. Thank you again for all of your great questions, for your time today.